As Christians, we are to be engaged with modernity, but not of modernity. And so the question is, as we mentioned last week, how then shall we cope with modernity? And Christian culture and modern culture are literally poles apart. To modernity, God is out and man is in. They believe in the omnicompetence of the human being. Christian culture stands for tolerance based on truth. Modernity does not. Christian culture holds to a biblical morality. Modernity does not. I think a vintage verse that describes modernity is out of Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 22 that I saw this week. They are wise in doing evil, but how to do good they know not. And that's an apt description, I think, of modernity today. Modernity is, not, is on the fast track to sexual revolution, too. We mentioned that last week as well. Same-sex marriage, for example, is uh, very common and, and more and more being promoted. Soon maybe polygamy. Why not marry a child? The kinkier, the better. Gender is not what you are, but what you feel. And now you can have two moms and no dad. And that's America today. And not only that, when it comes to contraception, it's so easy to get it anywhere. Basically, you can buy it right across the counter, and you can have sex with almost anything, no questions asked. And when it comes to the thing that's so prevalent now, growing in our country, homosexuality, it's in, so they say, get used to it. So this is modernity. It really is. It's America today. And this is one of my concerns, as I mentioned last week, because I've got grandchildren, and many of you have grandchildren too, but some of you as well have those that aren't married as yet and will eventually, God willing, be married. And what are they going to be facing as they have children and bring up children as well in this culture in which we live? It's something to really think about. How are they? Most of us, I think, that are here today are able to well cope with modernity. At least I hope we are. We're able to very much know that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. The old cliche, of course, that we know so well. So what I want us to do is go back and take a look at Moses' words to all of Israel, but especially to Joshua when Joshua was bringing Israel into the land of utter wickedness. Now, I say utter wickedness because God called it the promised land, but it was a land of wickedness. It really was, as we looked at last week. So Moses is here in this passage that we're looking at. He's encouraging Israel and their new leader, Joshua, for the challenge that's ahead of them as they enter into this, their modernity, so to speak, what they were going into. So let's see how that we can cope out of Deuteronomy 31.8. I'll read the verse and then we'll bring it on in its context and read it from the top. Verse 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Now let's pick it up in verse 1. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I'm 120 years old today, and I'm no longer able to go out or come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I commanded you. Here it is again. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua, just out of the crowd, I guess, and he said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to the fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not 
fear or be dismayed. Let's pray. Father, we want to be strong in this day in which we live. We want to be up to it. We want to be with it. We want to be individuals that are respected and yet not respected to the point where we would ever compromise. We pray that you would help us to be the kind of individuals in lip and in life that really speaks of this new kingdom that Jesus Christ has initiated in the world and one day will come to such a wonderful completion. So we pray that you would minister to each of our hearts and help us to be individuals that take the promises that God gives to us and respond to them positively. With all that you say in the scriptures, we should respond with. In his name we pray. Amen. God makes a wonderful promise here to the children of Israel. I think that you can see. And there's three things that he actually promises to Joshua in particular. He says, it is the Lord who goes before you. That's the first promise. Second promise, he will be with you. Third promise, he will not leave you or forsake you. So God prom makes these promises to us just as he made to them as they entered into their particular new adventure into the land of wickedness and as we live in modernity today. So God promises, first of all, to lead us. He said, it is the Lord who, go who goes or walks before you. Now back then, he's referring, of course, to all of Israel, but especially to Joshua. And for both of them, to Joshua as well as to Israel, as you know, God walked actually ahead of them in the pillar of cloud by day and in the pillar of fire by night. Now today it's more personal than that, it really is. Each Christian has the indwelling Holy Spirit living within us, residing there. He makes our heart his home. And he both not only guides us, but he leads us as well in this Christian life. He leads us through the salvation phases of justification and sanctification and glorification. He leads us through all of those particular phases of our salvation. And he also leads us into ministries and where to literally employ those gifts and callings that he's given to us. Peter was led to share the gospel with an Italian. That was quite a breakthrough. Paul was led into a ministry to the Gentiles just as Peter was led to, led to a ministry to Jews, Philip was led to share Christ with an Ethiopian man, obviously a black man from that part of the world. And James, well, he didn't go anywhere. He stayed in Jerusalem, the brother of our Lord, and he became the captain, so to speak, of the church that was in Jerusalem. So each one of them had, because of the indwelling spirit from the day of Pentecost, they had this particular calling upon their lives just as we do as children of God. So God promises to walk before us no matter who we are. That's one of the promises that he gives to us. Whatever we are walking into, God's already there. Boy, that's a great comfort. We don't know what's ahead, but he does because he's there. God meets it head on before we do no matter what it is that we're called to face. It doesn't come our way unless he ordains it. And before it gets to us, it has to go through him because he's out front, in front of every one of us. So God was walking in front of Israel into the troubled land. So God promised to lead us, but secondly, he promises as well to accompany us. It says he will be with you. Now you see, those two are similar. Well, there's a difference between the two. One has to do more with his leading, the other one more with his presence right there with them. And as you know today, as modernity goes from bad to worse, he is there to accompany us through it. We're certainly not alone. Israel was outnumbered, outclassed, outweaponed, but God would accompany them through it, and he did. Look at how the walls of Jericho came down and all the other nations that, of course, they were involved with. What about you and me? Well, when you're walking like some of us may be in a family crisis, God accompanies us. When you're walking in disease, God accompanies us. When we're walking through 
For example, people in North Korea, imprisonment. Brothers and sisters in, for example, the girls that are still in part of Africa where they were, what, 300 of them taken, something like that. And many of them raped, many of them have had children, a few of them have escaped and gotten back. But you can imagine the imprisonment that they're in, what they're experiencing. And many of them no doubt are Christians, I think it was out of a Christian setting that they were taken. And brothers and sisters, like I say, in North Korea, this place where he puts all of his money into the military, and now they have a missile that can reach Alaska, even part of our country. They have developed one that can go that far. So God is with us, and that's an important thing to realize. John Bunyan survived everything that he went through, and he went through a lot. In the midst of it all, he wrote three or four books, one of them about the grace of God, one of them about temptation and Satan and such as that. And of course, the one that's most outstanding that he wrote was Pilgrim's Progress, which is really one of the greatest stories there is, taking your Bible in hand and saying, how do I live the Christian life? Well, you've got your Bible there, and of course, he wrote this book that tells us how to live the Christian life as well and what to expect and how to deal with it just day by day as fellows whatever we go through as a child of God. So John Bunyan made this comment when he was in prison for 12 years. He said, I survived because I lived upon God. And that's true of each one of us when it comes to modernity today. So God's accompaniment makes it possible to go through anything. And I mean that, anything. I'm going through things. Physical things. Things that I don't especially like or want. I wish they would leave my house, <laughs> the house called my body, but they haven't. They really haven't. But the promise he makes to us is this, to accompany us. When you pass through the waters, he said, I'll be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and you shall not be consumed. It will not consume you. So God promises, first of all, to lead us, he promises to accompany us. He also promises to outstay us. God will not leave you or forsake you. God's sort of like a, a permanent fixture in our lives. A good one, of course. He's there for the duration of anything that we go through as a child of God. We might trip, we might fall, we might even quit. But the thing about God is that he hangs in there with us. He really does. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. This is what God said to Israel as they looked up and said, where's God in our lives? Where's God in our country? And God said to them, he gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. And it's because God outstays us that we make it through the worst of times. And that's why the Apostle Paul could say, when I am weak, then I am strong. He also said on another occasion, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. He delivered us from such a deadly peril. So because God outstays us in the worst of times, it enables us to go through these particular things. And even others might give up on us and walk out on us, but God will hang in there with us irrespective of what they do. It's because God outstays us that we make it actually to the finish line or you and I would never make it. It's because he outstays us. And to resist, which is very important, and this is one of the things that Israel had to face as they were going into the promised land, one of the biggest temptations that they had to encounter was a pagan culture that they were entering into. And to actually let that pagan culture become a part of them. And of course, that did eventually happen. God knew that it would happen, and he said it would happen. And he said that it would happen, I believe, through Moses. The temptation to exchange God's culture for pagan culture. And that's something that you and I as Christians face every day in our lives as individuals. And to resist, we must focus on the emphasis that's really made in this text. The promise is God himself. That's a great promise. 
Someone promises they're going to give you money, but when they promise to give you themselves, that's even a greater promise. And God does that when he says here, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. So he makes the promise of giving us himself as we enter into modernity. God is leading. God is accompanying. God is outstaying us. So we resist modernity by being God conscious. I have set the Lord always before me. The psalmist is really saying, David here, I'm God conscious every day when I get up. One of the verses that I've started to use now when I get out of bed and go into the kitchen to get some coffee going, I always use Psalm 73 that says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. That's a great text to start the day with as I get into it myself. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Well, the psalmist said, I have set the Lord always before me. And because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. So it's like us being God conscious and saying here, God is leading me. God is accompanying me. God is outstaying me. God consciousness. So what should our response be to God's promises? Well, not only to believe them and take them to the spiritual bank and cash them in, that's for sure. But what should our response be to God's promises? Well, our response to him should be what he says in the latter part of the verse, which is, do not fear or be dismayed. That should be our response to these promises that he makes to us. What are his promises? It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And then he says, do not fear or be dismayed. Three things here to notice. First of all, Faith instead of fear, it should be our response. Faith instead of fear. As modernity that we live in today further deteriorates, we need to respond with faith and not fear. Now I want to emphasize something here that I think is important. Faith and fear cannot coexist together in your life as an individual. Now there is what we might call good fear. Good fear is natural, I think we all know that. It's part of our body's special alarm system. For example, when you're going to hit the car in front of you, <laughs> all of a sudden, there's a great sense of fear. Or maybe as a lady, you're at home and it's nighttime and you're by yourself and all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. All of a sudden, fear can grip your heart. So there is fear that is really good. It's an emergency thing that God has placed into our lives. But there also, and the Bible speaks about this mostly, and that is bad fear. Bad fear is when the body's special alarm system keeps on sounding the alarm, and then we get stressed out. And not only that, but disease can develop. And that happens in our lives as individuals. We know that for sure. So there is fear that is good. It's a good thing that God's placed in us. We know the fear of God is a good thing but also the fear of other things as well. But there is bad fear, and that fear is when that emergency thing is just called upon too much. And as a result of it, it has a tremendous impact upon our lives. Faith is the antidote to fear. Faith develops and is reinforced by Scripture. Faith develops and is reinforced by Scripture. We know that by heart. It's like I'm preaching to the choir when I say that. Scripture puts faith in the foreground and it puts fear in the background. That's what Scripture does. Biblical ignorance in any of our lives breeds spiritual darkness which makes it easier to fall prey to modernity. I want you to hear about some spiritual ignorance that's in our churches today. You say, well, these are the modern churches, the liberal churches. No, no. This poll was taken in a number, a large number of evangelical churches. And this is what it is. You talk about biblical ignorance, here it is. 38% of American evangelicals agree that they can earn heaven by their good works. 63% of American evangelicals agree that our Savior 
is the first and greatest creature created by God. 52% of American evangelicals agree that while everyone sins a little, most people are good by nature. Now, if you're sitting here and agree with those, you're really dumb when it comes to good doctrine and theology. You really are. Because that speaks of biblical ignorance that's in our church. Where is it coming from? Why are they not doing better than this? Why do they not have better doctrine, better theology than what this percentage or these percentages show? It's biblical ignorance. And biblical ignorance, biblical ignorance breeds spiritual darkness, which makes it far easier for any Christian that calls himself a Christian to fall prey to modernity. And this is happening left and right. So we're not to fear modernity, however. We're really not. We're to fear God. The Bible says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10, 28. So our response should be what? First of all, faith instead of fear. Secondly, it should be courage instead of panic. Courage instead of panic. This word dismayed that's here, do not fear or be dismayed, is an interesting word. I was looking it up in the Hebrew, and it's actually translated broken, to be broken. But translators put in other words like our translation is dismayed, which is a good word, but the word broken is a little stronger, I think. So dismayed means to be broken, to be in panic, it means that, or to be scared stiff. Do you remember when David went with supplies from his father Jesse to the children of Israel to take some stuff to his brothers? What happened when he got there? He found Saul and he found his brothers and he found the children of Israel, the mighty men of Israel. He found them all dismayed. The word is used there. Or we might say scared stiff. That's exactly how they were. And Jeremiah, remember, as he starts out his ministry, was called to dress down Israel. Now you've got to remember to whom God was speaking. He was speaking to a man that was very tender. And a man who was a very an emotional prophet. That's why we call him an emo the emotional prophet or the weeping prophet. Because there's so much of that kind of tenor within his book. You have those sections where he's calling out to God and you see that sensitivity that he had more than perhaps any of the other prophets. And this is what God said to him. And do not fear those who... Or God said to him, but you dress yourself for work. Arise and say to them, that is to Israel, everything that I command you, do not be dismayed by them or do not be scared to death by them. Because they were a rebellious people. Stiff-necked, as the scripture calls them. So Israel was facing nations bigger and stronger and tougher than they were themselves. And so it was a call to really courage instead of panic. As you know, recently our Supreme Court passed down a verdict on same-sex marriage that could cause us a lot of alarm and panic too. And the reason I say that is because of Clarence Thomas, what he said, and Samuel Alito after the Supreme Court passed down this decision. They were dissenters against this, as you know. And this is what Justice Clarence Thomas warned. He warned of ruinous consequences for religious liberty. Justice Samuel Alito said, the decision will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. And Albert Moeller commented, head of the biggest Southern Baptist seminary up in Texas there, not Texas, but up in, um, up in uh, Kentucky. He said this, according to the argument offered by the majority, that's the Supreme Court, any opposition to same-sex marriage is rooted in moral animus against homosexuals. In offering this argument, the majority slanders any defender of traditional marriage. That's what we're up against today. And we're only seeing the top of the iceberg at this point, I think. 
unless things radically change in this country. So what should our response be? Well, first of all, faith instead of fear, courage instead of panic. And the last one is, I think, the greatest burden of all, and that is commitment instead of compromise. Commitment instead of compromise. Do not fear or be dismayed. Underneath the skin of our text is a call to commitment. It really is. For Israel, that meant to trust God and take the promised land. For us, that means commitment to the kingdom of God as we live our lives in the kingdom of man. Commitment is discipleship. And what is discipleship? Discipleship is giving up the rights to yourself. And remember when Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and make converts? He said, make disciples. Not just people who say, I want Jesus, count me in. No, no. Discipleship is giving up the rights to yourself. It's denying yourself. Discipleship is all or nothing, really, and the Word of God. Discipleship is not blasé or loose, loosey-goosey. Compromising is friendship with the world, James talks about. Compromising is loving this world, a watered-down Christianity, it really is. Our commitment is actually to be radical. Jesus, when he called disciples, he called them to something radical. And are we seeing that in our churches today? Are we seeing a radical Christianity? Are we really? You say, well, where does that radicalness come from? From what Jesus said. This is what he said. He said, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. What did he mean by that? Well, he goes on to say, whoever finds his life will lose it. So if you don't take up the cross, and that's what he's saying here, you are taking up something else, and you're going to lose your life as a result of it. He goes on to say these particular words, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So losing your life is tantamount to taking the cross and following him. That's what he is saying. So what does it mean to actually take up the cross of Jesus Christ? Wear it around your neck? Good thing to do, of course. It's a testimony. Like the Jews, you have it between your eyes, the scriptures, and on your wrist and on the doorposts. All good things, that's for sure. Good things to do. I don't knock that at all. But when he speaks of taking up our cross and following him, he's talking about being willing to suffer for Christ. He's talking about even being so radical as being willing to die for Christ. We have seen pictures of Christians from Syria kneeling down with somebody behind them with a knife because they won't recant cutting their throats, cutting their heads off as it rolls in the sand. All kinds of them have done that. Thousands of them have been, shall we say, put to death because they have taken up the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what it means. That's how radical it is. We can't water it down. We can't be loosey-goosey with this gospel of Jesus Christ, which is happening in so many of our churches. It's just easy believism, you know? There's no real taxing to this thing of Christianity. No real demands upon us at all. I want to tell you, there are strong demands here by what Jesus Christ says when he says, Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So it's saying with Jesus, not my will, but what you will. It's saying with the Apostle Paul when he said, for me to live is Christ. That's what it means to take up your cross and follow him. Or when Paul said this, but may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So when you take up your cross, it's just... A word going out, shall we say. It's, naked up a cross is not a disease, by the way. It's not asthma that I've got. It's not heart disease that I have or the disease that you may have or the problems that you say, my family, my family is a disease. It's my cross. That isn't what he was talking about. 
We completely distort Scripture when we talk about stuff like that. We don't get the pithy, poignant thing that he's really talking about. We really don't. To take up the cross is much stronger than that. It really is. Much stronger. Willing to suffer for Christ. Willing to die for Christ. It's saying with Jesus in the garden when he split, literally blood came through his pores on the ground. Not what I will, but what you will. And as Paul says, for me to live as Christ. And so I want to say today to all of us, anything short of this is not salvation. You lose. Anything short of that is not salvation. You lose. Jesus said that himself. So I plead with you today to make sure you're a disciple and not just a wolf in sheep's clothing. So how do we cope then? Just to wrap it up with modernity, number one, I would say focus on God's promise that we've got here in the text, but throughout the scriptures, the promises that he gives to us, how that we can hope with this, cope with this age in which we live. But the second thing is to respond with those three things we just finished with. To respond to modernity with faith instead of fear, courage instead of panic, commitment instead of compromise. Amen? That's important. Let's pray. Father, keep us from being Christian wimps. Keep us from being loosey-goosey with these great truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot compromise with the world and call ourselves a believer. We can't water down our Christianity and call it Christianity. We must be willing to suffer for Christ, even to die for Him. And to be a disciple, to deny ourselves, giving up the rights to ourselves, it's all or nothing. It's not cheap. So help us today to spread this around to our family members. And when we see them tipping off the edge, not to just let them do it and just pray for them, which is good. It's good to pray for them, but we need to take them in hand and talk with them. The Bible speaks of us doing that, encouraging one another, and even holding each other accountable as far as that goes. And so help us to do that with our family members and help us to do that with each other, to care enough even to confront. We thank you today that in the midst of the world in which we live, and it's quite a world, that there is a kingdom that Jesus Christ is building. And it's so wonderful to be a part of it. We give you praise that you have brought us to faith in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now help us to stand as true disciples. In his name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen.